Well, please turn with me in your Bibles back to Acts chapter 2 this evening as we come uh, now to our first message in a very short series that I want to think about this evening and uh, throughout the next number of weeks. Uh, Acts chapter 2, I I draw your attention especially to the words of verse 37. That will be our text for this evening. The words of the Apostle Peter or really the reference to what happens after these people hear Peter preaching the gospel. Let's read verse 37 together once more before we pray. And we read these words. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were pricked in the heart and they said, what shall we do? Let's ask the Lord for his help this evening. Our blessed Father, our gracious God, we're so thankful for a glimpse, even through the hymns that we've sung this evening of the majesty of Christ on the cross. None like unto him. But Lord, we think of the journey that many must take before they come to faith in Christ, called by the Spirit, challenged through the Word of God. Here, as we shall see this evening, that sense of conviction of sin that leads a man or a woman to say, what must I do to be saved? Help us this evening to understand, may it bless the believer as well as speak to the unsaved. And may the Lord give us all understanding, give me Boldness to preach, clarity of thought, simplicity and expression, and the very anointing. Lord, the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God, unction for me. We pray these things in the Savior's name. Amen. For those of us that were here on Wednesday when we had the deputation meeting uh, with our brother Rodney Davison, it was very refreshing at the end of his address and his presentation uh, when he mentioned about the prevalence in that part of Africa that he was referring to. Uh, for people to respond so very easily to the appeals which are made. He was speaking about the context of the prison ministry. And uh, for those that were there Wednesday, you were aware of what he was saying about how it was possible for, for many, maybe from other Christian persuasions, to possibly get a great response. Many hands in the air, many people coming forward. But the prison staff, as Rodney was saying, would often observe how little change this created in their lives and what a difference they were seeing in the lives of men that were uh, genuinely saved and uh, really demonstrated the fruit of the Spirit in their lives. And it, it was a very honest and a very challenging thing that Rodney was mentioning on Wednesday. Got me thinking a lot about our own situation and the days in which we live. And I think the first thing that we want to say this evening is that the problem of false professions is not one which is isolated to any one country or any one nation under the face of the sun and this world in which we live. In many ways, the Christian church has been blighted for for many years now. I'm not going to put a time frame to it. I'm not going to say to see if it's been for so many years, whether it's 10 or 50 or 100. I think maybe it's a common problem throughout the years. But there is always a, a problem and a risk that we can be exposed to the prevalence of false professions. And and the reason why this is a harmful thing is that it leads people down the wrong track. It builds up hope, it seems to encourage us, and then we see people drifting away, and and we begin to ask the questions, well, you know, what has happened in the first place? Have people truly been saved? Is this the power of God unto salvation? How do we make head and tail of any of these things that we see in the world in which we live? So as we address that particular question this evening, I suggest that part of the problem is this. Partly it's method. And my intention this evening is not really to deal with that. I don't want to think about the method. I'm not going to address it this evening in my message. But the other part of the problem, the equation, is what I want to deal with this evening and throughout these next number of weeks. It is a deficiency within the message. It is sometimes only the case that people will hear what we might say half a gospel message. Half of what the gospel is to be as it's presented to us in light of the Holy Scriptures and the Word of God. 
And that's why it's so important for us, whether we are Christians this evening or even if we are not saved, to go back to what I've called the basics in Scripture and to come to a full understanding of what we mean by the conversion of a soul. And, I, and the way in which I want to under, underscore this this evening is by saying something very simple. We cannot afford to be wrong. I cannot afford to stand here in this pulpit and as a Christian minister and to present to you part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can't do that. I can't do that as I stand before God on that judgment day and I give account of my ministry, my words, and everything that comes from my mouth and from this, this Christian pulpit. And we can't do that myself, ourselves this evening in this church. And, and, and it's, it's a message that we have to make sure that we understand as best as we possibly can. What is it when God is pleased to work in the life of any person? I mean, that's a tremendous subject. That's one that should really whet our appetite or, you know, whet our thirst and increase our appetite and get us asking the question, so Lord, what does it mean when God is pleased to, to take a man or a woman and to work in them new life in Jesus Christ? We could so easily speak of conversion, professions, salvation, being saved, but what is it? What is it to, to see and to understand and to know and to expect and to pray for and to anticipate? Well, that's really my intention this evening as we come to the likes of Acts 2 and verse 37. Let me say by way of introduction that no one conversion experience is going to be a carbon copy of another. I know sometimes we like to think it's going to be that way. It won't be. It won't be. Of course, everyone will come through Jesus Christ. And everyone will hear the gospel being declared and there must be faith in the Saviour and a turning from sin. And of course we insist in all of these things. But it's not the case that a person's testimony is an exact replica of someone else's. It's just not the way God is pleased to work in life and in society. But what we can insist upon this evening, as the Word of God insists upon, that there will be things which are present when God works in your life. And one of those things that must be a reality is conviction of sin. That's precisely what we're going to deal with for a number of weeks. Uh, messages such as being born again, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, true repentance, peace with God, all of these things that make up God working in the soul of a man or a woman. And I certainly have prayed and I trust that, that these messages will do a number of things. Many of us this evening know the Lord and I rejoice in that. But I want these messages to encourage you first of all. I want them to build you up in your own faith. I want them to even confirm to you the things that you know to be true. And if you lack assurance, or maybe you're not where you need to be as a Christian, I trust that God will use these messages to bring you back to himself, to give assurance to your heart, to encourage you in your own life. But especially if you're not saved this evening. If you sit here once again under the sound of God's word, and the Lord has began to work in your soul. There's been a troubling of your life. The questions are being raised and they're being asked. And you're starting to think to yourself, you know what? I don't think I am saved. I don't believe I've been converted. I don't think I understand what it means to be a Christian. Then, of course, my prayer is that in the midst of these messages, God will give you eyes to see. And that you'll leave even this evening having been gloriously and wonderfully saved converted to Jesus Christ. We have to begin right here. What is conviction of sin? What is it when God takes a dealing with any person? Well, there's a number of things that we can uh, notice as we look at verse 37 this evening. First of all, uh, when we look at conviction of sin, we want to think about what God uses when he convicts us of sin. What is it that God is pleased to use when he convicts people of sin. We'll turn your attention to the, our text of Scripture this evening. And notice the, how the Bible reads here in verse 37. Now when they heard this, right there before your eyes this evening, my dear friends, you've got the answer to the first question. What is it that God is going to use when he brings a person under genuine conviction of sin? Well, do you not see it? Do you not see God at work? Do you not see it? 
when they heard this. They were pricked in their hearts. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, well, what are we going to do? We feel our great need. We feel the weight of all of these things. But I want you to see this evening, God is using something, isn't he? He's using his word. He's using the preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Now, I know that this whole occasion in Acts 2 gives to us that, that amazing occasion where it's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. And, you know, what a, what a day to experience. Sometimes people ask the question, if you could go back to any time in the Bible and live out that experience, we all have our top ten, don't we, of things we want to see for ourselves or witness for ourselves. Can you imagine being in the midst of of uh, the crowds, the thousands, the 3,000, the men and the women, all of these Jews coming together, and, and the outpouring of the Spirit, and here are the apostles, and they begin to preach with other languages, languages they've never learned before. And so here were Hebrews and Jews from all different parts and parcels of the world in which they came from, and they could speak Hebrew, but they had other languages. Uh, are the languages which they had learned over a period of time. And all of a sudden, they hear this gospel. But they're hearing it in this other language. And, and Peter and the rest of the apostles, they, they haven't gone to college and university to learn these things. It's an instantaneous gift to learn earthly languages never learned before. It's a remarkable thing. And you might think that will do the trick that will, be, that will bring the, the crowds into the kingdom of God. Well, yes, the Lord used it to prepare the way to a, to a great extent. But that's not what the text is telling us here in verse 37. No, it's not when they saw this. It's not when they saw this. It's not when they experienced this. It's not when they even felt this. No, they're going to feel things and they're going to experience things. But you see it when they heard. When they heard when they heard the preaching of Peter, God began to do a work in their hearts. And, and I believe that this is absolutely vital for us to understand. God uses his word to bring about genuine conviction of sin. Do you know why he does it? Do you know why, dear Christian? And, and if you're not saved this evening, do you know why he does this? Because this is the very word the Holy Spirit of God breathed out and has given You'll be familiar with the likes of John chapter 16 when the Lord Jesus spoke of the, the, the coming of the Holy Spirit in the fullest sense of, of, of the word. Of course, the Holy Spirit was always in operation and activity in Old Testament times. But the Savior says, you know, I have to go away so that I can send another in my place, even the Spirit of truth, even the Comforter. And the Lord Jesus said to the multitudes and to his disciples in John 16, he says, when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he's going to do something. Do you know what he's going to do? He's going to approve. He's going to convince. That's what the word means. He's going to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And right there, you'll start to see the first glimpse of what we mean by conviction. And it's this. The Holy Spirit, when he comes into the life of any man or woman, what he does, he proves, he convinces, he demonstrates truth to the heart. That's what God does when he saves. Do you see it? There are things that we've never been persuaded of, we've not been convinced of. It's not just conviction of sin, we're going to deal with that. But there's a whole challenge of our whole being. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And he'll convince you of sin. He'll prove how much of a sin you are in the eyes of God. And he'll prove the righteousness of a holy God. And he'll prove, he'll prove the justice of God in a righteous judgment. That's what he's going to do. And the Holy Spirit is pleased to do this very thing as he uses his word. And that's what he does. He takes up Peter and he takes up the apostles. And it's very simple what they're doing. It's not a complicated message. And in fact, there's no add-ons, there's no thrills, there's nothing else. Peter stands and he preaches. And it's direct. And as we shall see in a moment, there's, there's, a, there's a structure, there's an order, there's a, there's a way in which Peter is going to preach. And when they heard this, when they heard this, they were convinced and they were convicted. I'm asking this evening, do you know anything of that? I'm asking this evening, 
before you answer any other question, is there a time when the Holy Spirit took a verse and a passage and a part of God's holy truth and he put it into your heart and soul in such a manner like never before? Your eyes were opened and you began to realize God is speaking to me. Maybe this evening that's the case. We sat here for a while now and you've heard this gospel being preached and it's a good thing. Keep yourself sat under the preaching of the word of God because that's where God gives light. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. But also we might say under this, this particular point that there was an application of the word, not just the, the author who is the Holy Spirit because Peter's preaching gives us a, a wonderful blueprint and a, a good one for me as well, but, but, but for all of us in terms of our understanding of when we preach the gospel and we think of the Christian faith. I, I look at the likes of Acts 2 and do you know what I see? I see a few things. First of all, I see Peter doing this. He's constantly referring to Scripture. Again, in your own time, do this. Read over Acts 2. Read Peter's sermon. And he's going back to the Psalms of David. He's, he's going back to the Word of God. Peter is not standing there to preach and saying, you know what, the Old Testament's a closed book and we've got something whole new to reveal to you. This is the fulfilling of the Word of God. And it's that he takes, it's that he uses, and it's that that God blesses. And then Peter does something else as he preaches. He's careful to lay hold of the attention of the people. I'm going to give you three instances. Acts 2 verse 22. Ye men of Israel. Grabs hold of them. It's like me saying to you. You know, you know uh, people of Newton Arts. Uh, not that I'd ever call you out by name or get your attention in that respect. I think that would be... Uh, an unwise thing to do, but certainly to grab hold of you and to say, brother or sister or a friend, to, to, to make you listen. Peter is, is, is doing that. He's, he's unfolding the word of God and he says, will you listen? Men of Israel, listen. God is speaking to you. Verse 29, men and brethren. Verse 36, let all the house of Israel know He's getting a hold of them. And I think when the Lord is pleased to save a soul and convert you, I think there's many of us that know what I'm talking about here because this was your experience. The Lord was singling you out. It was your name. It was you. No one else mattered. Nothing else mattered. God was beginning to trouble you. And he realized, I've got to deal, I've got to deal with this. Something needs to happen here. Thirdly, and most importantly, in this particular blueprint of Peter's preaching, he brings them all to consider our Lord Jesus Christ. And the, and the lovely thing about Peter's message, the thing I just so, so in awe of, in a sense, is that it's all building up to this particular pinnacle. It's all about the Savior. It's not, it's not Peter. It's not Peter. Oh, that we would just get, get a hold of this. That it's, it's not about this preacher in the pulpit or the fame of any man and none of these things. We're, we're, not, we're not consumed with Peter here. It's, it, it, it's, this, it's, this, it's this glimpse of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the pinnacle is right there in verse 36. That God hath made that same Jesus. There he is, that same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. And that was it. That was the, that was the missing piece of the jigsaw. And when they heard it, when they heard it, God take a, took a dealing with their hearts, didn't he? Dear, dear, dear friend, if you're not saved this evening, you've got to come to realize something very important. Not just the plain fact that Jesus Christ died upon the cross, but you must see your sin on him. And the moment that you realize that it's your sin on him, there is that piercing of the heart mine me he died for me you see the beginnings of conviction of sin that same Jesus whom you crucified and that was a hammer blow to their pride and to their thoughts so what God uses when he convicts men and women of sin it's his word isn't it it's the gospel well what takes place when there is conviction of sin. Well, let me suggest, first of all, there is a recognition or there is a recognizing. 
Now, Luke here, Luke uses the word pricked. And, uh, you know, Luke is a doctor, as we know, a medical doctor. And he, he has always a great interest in medical terms. And, and you know, parts of, we might say, the, the, the anatomy, the heart, and, the, uh, and, and all aspects along those lines. And I think there's, there's, there's a particular aspect in which that comes to light here. That, you know, Luke is giving us a diagnosis here. He's, he's looking into the, the life of the individual. And he says, what is happening to these people? They're, it's not a, just a, a, a physical trauma which is taking place. That there's something more than this. The very soul and heart is under deep conviction. There is that piercing, that's what the word means, a thorough piercing within a soul and within a heart. I want this to be clear to us this evening because there is a, often a common misunderstanding of what conviction is or conviction of sin is. Some think that conviction in terms of, you know, when the Lord's about to save someone is simply a matter of a sense of shame or guilt. Now, I, of course it includes a sense of shame and guilt without a question. But it's not that in and of itself. These things will not be found alone. And the reason why is there are many people on the face of this earth that feel a sense of guilt and shame that have no thought of Christ at all in their mind. You've, you've got, you know, religions and, and many religions in this world in which we live. And you might go to various parts of this world and, and they, they might be, you know, some people living what we would consider barbaric lives or, or doing things that we would never dream of, but they might even think the same about what goes on in our countries. And yet still, when there might perceive to be a darkness in their lives, there are things that they do and there's a, there's a shame, there's a guilt, they'll, they'll hide. These things are just reminders that we're, we have humanity, we're, we have a conscience, we're, we're not animals. And even though our conscience has been terribly affected by the fall and by sin, it still functions. It's, it's still used by God. But just feeling shame and guilt and leaving it as it is, is not genuine conviction of sin, as we shall see. Neither is conviction of sin just a fear of death. Again, people rely upon that too much. I'm afraid to die. And they think that's conviction of sin. Well, it's good to have a fear if you're not saved of your approaching end. And you know what? If you're not saved, you're, you're, you're foolish to consider the very fact that tomorrow could be your last day and not tremble and not fear. But still, that is not conviction of sin. Neither is it just simply knowing right from wrong and wrong from right and knowing the difference between the two. Genuine conviction of sin, and this is how we should understand it biblically, is always with God in view. Always with God in view. That we see, and I don't know, I, I want to make this as simple as I can this evening. You see the loathsomeness, the awfulness, the, 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 the terrible, wicked, depraved nature of one sin. That has to sink into our hearts. It has to resonate with us. We have to see these things. It might be hard. It might, it might be grim to us. It might be heavy to hear. It might not lift our souls. It might not be to us what we think is good news. Well, there can be no good news until the seriousness of just the one sin is brought home. How do I see the loathsomeness, O oh God, of my sin? I see it when I see the majesty and the holiness and the glory of God. In, in, ineffably, one hymn where it says, sublime. And to see the sun for a moment blinds us. How much more the eternal God of purer eyes that you cannot look acceptably upon one sin. Do you, do you find it hard to grasp? I do. I do. Well, the scripture says God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. And then, then we see it, don't we? This, you know, the, the, the almighty God and my sin against him. And that, that's when the beginnings of conviction takes place because we realize it's not just guilt and shame and a sense of right and wrong and, and, and this feeling of I haven't done something right, but no, it's against him. 
It's him. Do you see it? Uh, Lord, I've sinned against you. Against only you. It was, it was Joseph in, uh, in Genesis 39 verse 9. And he, he said this as a believer. How, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? That's how he saw it. And I, I say to you that conviction of sin is when you recognize not just that you have sinned, but against whom. Paul says when the commandment came, it was revived. I died. I died. So great was my sin against so great a God. And in recognizing, there is agonizing. Agonizing. That's conviction of sin. Again, I want to just put a bit of a disclaimer out and a qualify here that, again, I recognize, and I don't want you to go away thinking, you know, I didn't feel that depth of, of things when I was saved. It will, it will differ one person to another. And, and, and certainly if it's a little child, compared to maybe someone who's lived 50 years in, in, in deep, open, obvious sin, there, there are all different levels of a sense in which we feel the conviction of our sin that we might even agonize, but there must be, to some measure, a reality to it. We must feel it. I, I recognize my sin against God, and, I, and I'm heavy over it, I, and I agonize over it. And this, this agony is not just for a fleeting moment. It's not just, you know what, I'm found out, and then you get over it, and you harden yourself, and you go on. You can't sleep. Maybe you, 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 you can't rest. I've heard of many conversion stories where that happens, and, and, and there's no rest for the soul. I do, I'm just troubled. How do I get right with God? I don't know what to do. And it's like Pilgrim's Progress, as I mentioned to the boys and girls earlier on. So you can write down your answer here. Pilgrim's Progress, it was Christian. It was the main character. It was Pilgrim himself, called Christian, who has that big burden on his back. He's read the word. He knows the judgment's coming. And he feels, he feels so much his need. How do I get this load off me? Well, Christian is under conviction of sin, isn't he? And he's agonizing. He's agonizing. One uh, classical Bible commentator called William Plummer, uh, on his commentary on the Psalms, used David as an illustration. I, I love this illustration. I think it helps us this evening. And he mentioned how when David in Psalm 51 verse 8 said this, and again, David's talking about when he backslid. It's not about conversion at this stage, but remember when he backslid and he sinned so terribly and he came back. But before he came back to the Lord, he says, Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. William Plummer he used the illustration of broken bones as a way of illustrating the agony that is present when God convicts us. It was a very powerful illustration, probably because I suffered from broken bones myself and know of others, obviously, who have broken bones uh, not too far from us. Uh, but, but many of you will, will know the same. But you can go further. It's not just a broken bone. It could be a, a, an ongoing sickness. It could be bad toothache, bad migraines. It could be anything of that nature. And for many people, when they are suffering great pain, and it doesn't even have to be physical pain, it can be emotional pain as well. But you get the point of what I'm saying this evening. Uh, particularly, say, for, with a broken limb, what happens when there's a throbbing, an aching? You, you can't settle, can you? You, you, you wake up at night, you can't get the position, you can't get the, the night's sleep that you need, you, you can't get comfortable, you're restless, and you're just trying everything you possibly can just to get some relief from the pain. And until, until the bone is fixed, until the injury is resolved, until the sickness passes and the pain is moved, the agonizing, it just stays. Do you know anything about that? If you're not saved. I'm not saying there's any merit in agony. We don't earn favor with God. We don't bring down blessings. We don't make ourselves more holy by, by feeling these things. But surely it cannot be possible to see God and all of his holiness and see our sins and just um, skip through life and think, you know what? Oh, well, I've got a friend in Jesus. We must feel the weight of, of how, how serious this is. This is what these, these, these men and these people felt. They were pierced. That's what the word prick means. They were pierced. God took his truth and divided in their thoughts and said, you're in great need. And they said, what do we do? What do we do? We're agonizing. 
Maybe again, that's where you are, my friend. It's where you are. What happens next? I'll finish with this last point. What happens next when convicted of sin? Ah, oh, isn't verse 37 quite wonderful? Men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? Aren't you glad they didn't stop short at conviction of sin? They asked a question. They wanted to get right with God. Isn't that wonderful? Don't stop short this evening. I'm going to tell you why. Don't stop short. For to be left in writhing under conviction of sin without the answer and without the solution is to be most miserable indeed. Which is why we always say, and every good preacher will always say this, that conviction of sin, no matter how deep and distressing it may be, in itself is not saving. Conviction is not conversion. Do not stop short when it comes to being convicted of sin. Felix in Acts 24, verse 25 is the example. He heard Paul preach. And, and Paul reasoned of truth and of judgment and so forth. And then the Bible says, Felix trembled. Conviction of sin. But he stopped short. Go your way, Paul. I'll, I'll call another time. It's a terrible thing to see, but so sadly it happens again and again and again. And I don't want anyone here this evening to stop short at God dealing with your soul. I finished this evening by something I probably would never normally do, and that's reading out a sort of a bit of a lengthy quote, but I, I read it for a reason. I want to listen carefully. It was a leaflet or a book written by English Puritan Matthew Mead, and some of you may have read it or come across it. It's called The Almost Christian. I think it has another title, but I forget what that is. The Almost Christian. And, and what he's talking about here, and, and he gives all these headings, by the way. Now, if this was a sermon, this would have gone on for hours, trust me. Because, I mean, you've got about 20 different headings here. So if he preached this, and some Puritans did, there's always that famous illustration of the Puritan that had 70-something points in his sermon. And uh, I remember hearing that thinking, by the time he got to number 49, you'd be thinking, 50 has to be the last one. And then he goes on for another 20 or so afterwards. Well, a different era, maybe a different time, a different threshold that people had. Well, Matthew Mead, he, he wrote this powerful article in which he gave all these headings about the almost Christian. Now, he developed them, and I'm not going to develop them because we don't have the time, but I am going to give you the headings. Let me read them to you. He says a man, he just means anyone. A man may have much knowledge and be an almost Christian. A man may have great and eminent spiritual gifts and be an almost Christian. A man may have a high profession of religion and be much in external duties of godliness and be an almost Christian. A man or a woman may go far in opposing his sin and be an almost Christian. A man may hate sin and be an almost a Christian. A man may make great vows and promises and have strong purposes and resolutions against sin and yet be but an almost Christian. He goes on and he says, a man may maintain a strife and a combat against sin. He may be a member of a Christian church. He may have great hopes of heaven. He may be under visible changes. He may be zealous in matters of all religion. He may be much in prayer. He may suffer for Christ. He may know a call of God in some respect. He may have the Spirit of God. He means be, you know, striven with and challenged by the Spirit of God. He, he may have a faith in a degree of some form of agreeing to things. He may have a love for the people of God. He may try to obey the commands of God. He, he may have some form of being even sanctified, a, an appearance of holiness. And he finishes and says, a man may do all the external duties of worship which a true Christian can do and be an almost a Christian. It would be a most awful thing to be under conviction of sin this evening and be almost there and then die not there. Men and brethren, what do we do? How, how, what are we going to do? 
And maybe the Lord is putting that question in your heart this evening. Well, what do I do then, Pastor? What do I say? Well, in the words of Paul and Silas to that jailer in Philippi, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Let's close in prayer and seek the Lord together. Dear Father in heaven, we ask you to challenge the hearts of all this evening. We pray that we would not be the almost Christian. We pray that under the conviction of sin that the Lord might bring us through. And even if there is someone this evening and their heart is troubled, and Lord, they want to get peace with God, I pray that I would give them the, the grace to see that there is a Savior. There is one even now, even now, that is willing to save them or bring that wandering person home. We pray that you'll bless your word, that you'll encourage us even as God's people, that you'll be with us in our fellowship this evening and take us to our homes in safety. Be with us throughout the week, Lord, and give us opportunities to love thee, to serve thee, and to be witnesses for thee. We pray in the Savior's name. Amen.